Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this third Sunday of Advent. Today, the Spickler family is coming to join us to light the candle of joy. And uh, actually, because none of the candles are lit, um, we're going to give an opportunity for everyone to light first the candle of hope, which is what we focused on the first week, the candle of peace, which we focused on last week. Today is the pink candle, and that's the candle of joy. I'm going to let Lizzie do the pink one, but Sam, why don't you come over here and start us out and light the first, the candle of hope. Gosh, you're very good. <laughs> Emma, you must have been lighting birthday candles. Well, here, let's light, light, light the second one, then we'll let Lizzie do the third. Okay, go on over there and let out Lizzie. All right, Lizzie, here we go. Lizzie, are you joyful? Are you excited? Are you happy about Christmas time? Do you want to help Sam? Do you want to help your sister? There you go. Is it already pushed? You have to push again. It's okay. It's okay. You got it. <laughs> well, I love the family teamwork. Spicklers, thank you very much for helping us like Christmas is a time of joy. That's what we're going to talk about today. So thank you, Spicklers. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you please open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. While you're doing that, let me ask you guys a question. Here's a, an alert. Uh, your pastor is about to geek out on some personal experiences, okay? So um, let me ask you this question, and, and you will see the nature of my geeking out in just one moment. Have any of you ever been to Yellowstone National Park? Okay. Well, for those of you that have not, let me show you some of my memories. So Yellowstone National Park is an absolutely amazing, beautiful, iconic place in the world. This was the first ever national park that was established in 1872 by President Ulysses S. Grant. Now let me show you some pictures of wildlife. In the park you will find bison. Oh, look. The, um, an amazing, I'm so sorry, I forgot. There's an, an amazing... Um, uh, lodge in the park, and I, I forget the year that this was built, but let me show you the inside of it. Um, they're actually like trees. This is not just wood that was timbered and, and, and you know, hewed in a uh, sawmill, but literally maybe hand-hewn literal trees making up this gigantic lodge. It was built so long ago, and yet it stands today. Let's look at another one. It's just absolutely gorgeous how big this structure is. It's absolutely amazing. Now, you also see amazing wildlife. Just quickly, there's, there's bison. There's also bears. There's also uh, wolves. There's also uh, eagles. And there's elk. And Wait, that's a moose. <laughs> um, but there's also, uh, there's the elk. <laughs> there, and, and, and there's not just big uh, land creatures. There's little creatures. And it's just absolutely amazing. But when most people think of Yellowstone, they think about geysers. Beautiful scenery waterfalls and rivers, but they think of geysers. And uh, now, what's the most, we know the most famous reindeer of all, but what's the most famous geyser of all? <laughs> Old Faithful. It, it, it goes off about every 20 minutes. It shoots 180 feet up into the air. But Old Faithful is just one geyser. There are many, many, many geysers. Go ahead, go through and look at these pictures. They're absolutely beautiful. But geysers don't only just shoot up in the air. There's other types of geysers. So in this national park, you actually, it, Yellowstone basically sits upon a top of volcano. And, um, and underneath the, the earth, there's bubbling, molten, hot heat. And, and geysers don't only shoot up in the air. There's different types of geysers. I just want to pause on this one right here. There's certain geysers that are called 
mud pots. And rather than these beautiful erupting uh, visions of, of grandeur, it's, it's kind of like a, a mix between uh, liquid and solid, kind of like a, you ever oatmeal on a stove, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it kind of bubbles up and boop, it just kind of poop, it burbles, it gurgles, it burps, it kind of pops up. Well, that's what these mud pots do. And now, so you don't just think I'm geeking out and sharing with you family vacation memories. There's a, a reason that I'm showing you these pictures of Yellowstone uh, National Park. The first reason, because in 2014, my family went there. It was a wonderful, beautiful, um, incredible vacation. And we got to learn uh, so much and just enjoy our family and our time there. It, was, it just it reminds me of great times that brings joy to my life. But also... Thinking about geysers, geysers remind me of joy. Today, Lizzie and Samantha lit the candle of joy. We're talking about joy, and geysers remind me of joy. I want to share some of those lessons for all of you. Like geysers, joy bubbles up and it overflows. Like geysers, it, it, it starts deep within and it, it heats up and it comes to the surface and somehow, some way, it's going to break through in your life. Sometimes our joy is like a, a big burst and eruption like Old Faithful. But other times, joy might be slow rolling like those mud pots simmering beneath the surface. Nothing spectacular. But a gurgle and a burble and a burp of poof, joy comes out. Joy is the trait that we're exploring today on this third Sunday of Advent. So far we focused on hope and then we lit the candle of peace. And today is joy. Next Sunday will be the fourth candle. One Sunday before Christmas and that's celebrating the candle of love. Celebrating God's love. And how Jesus fulfilled all of these traits. Through these four traits, we can learn and we can rediscover Christmas. That's what this series is called, Rediscovering Christmas. And we can do it despite our challenges, in spite of our hardships, in spite of our difficulties. We can experience joy because Christ was born. Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And because God is with us, we can experience joy in life no matter what our external circumstances are. Because God is bigger. God is deeper. God is above. He's below. He's all around. And because of God, we can experience joy in our lives. So today's sermon specifically is called Finding Joy in Our Discouragement. Because many times the circumstances of life, it doesn't build us up, it, it weighs us down. So even in the midst of a weighted down life, even in the midst of discouragement, our message this morning, because of Christ, because of his birth, because God is with us, we can find joy even in our discouragements. Now look, there's a lot of joy throughout the Christmas story. The biblical Christmas story. It's not separate from pain and disappointment. In fact, much of the joy from the Christmas story comes out of long disappointment and, and even grief. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look closely at the stories of Elizabeth and Mary. And Luke's Christmas story begins with a prophet named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. So in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5, Luke says this. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless 
because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Luke 1, 5 to 7. Now, this short paragraph would have spoken volumes of information to Luke's original audience. We've got Herod, the Roman king, of Roman control. These are difficult times for the Jewish nation. And in the midst of these difficult times, we meet Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they're both of a priestly heritage. Now, this was a day and time when lots of religious corruption and power plays by the Pharisees and Sadducees were, were taking place. And against this corrupt time, we have this, this backdrop where we're introduced to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they're a stark contrast to the religious leaders of the day. They're in stark contrast because Luke describes Zechariah and Elizabeth as righteous, blameless, and faithful. The Bible says that Zechariah and Elizabeth are old and they have never been able to have children. Well, that fact changes suddenly and miraculously when the archangel Gabriel shows up. Gabriel shows up. He tells Zechariah that his wife is going to have a son, a, a powerful prophetic son who will prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Zechariah is, is overwhelmed. But he can hardly believe the news. And when he questions the angel if this is true or not, the archangel says, oh, do you want a sign? I'll, I'll give you a sign. Here's a sign, Zachariah, because you don't believe me. I'm not going to allow you to speak until your son is born. So Zachariah is forced to write and sign and tell people the exciting news that the angel came to visit him, even though he's very old and his wife is very old and she's going to have a baby. And here's Zachariah not even being able to talk and tell people about it. But you think I talk with my hands. Imagine what Zechariah must have been doing when he couldn't use his voice and all he could do was through the expressions of his face and the writing of his hand, which, you know, they didn't have ballpoint pens back then. It was a difficult thing. Imagine what it must have been like to be able to let that joy come out when it wouldn't be coming out of his mouth. Now, it seems that Elizabeth was a little quicker to believe the angel when he gave her the news that she would become pregnant. It says in verse 25 of chapter 1, Elizabeth says, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. The Bible says that Elizabeth went into seclusion for the first five months of her pregnancy. And maybe this has something to do with the public disgrace that verse 25 is talking about. She was disgraced for her inability to have children. She's very old, the Bible says. So this was a, a, a lifelong source of pain and, and sorrow and, and even shame. To not bear children was a really big deal in that culture. Young couples were expected to get married and have children. It was God's command to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. Zechariah and Elizabeth were not able to contribute to God's plan, to God's command. So young Jewish women would have questioned Elizabeth. Why can't you have children? What are you doing? What sin do you have in your life that God would punish you like this? Young Jewish women would have questioned and cast judgments on Elizabeth. Now, we don't, we don't know, but maybe, maybe there were pregnancies that sparked hope in the life of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But maybe those hopes were dashed by miscarriages and loss. We're not sure. We just know that she never bore children. Elizabeth's self-worth probably sunk as the years passed and in hope of childbearing dimmed. At some point, Elizabeth herself and everyone around her would have declared that she was barren and branded 
with that lifelong stigma. Maybe that's why she stayed in seclusion for the first five months of her pregnancy. She just wanted to, to savor those days of pregnancy in her own terms. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, Gabriel makes another earthly appearance, but not to Elizabeth. But Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary. And he's delivering the most miraculous pregnancy announcement of all. Mary received the news gracefully and willingly, but at some point she realized that she would have challenges and disgrace would come upon her. She knew that she would face scorn and shame because she was a virgin and now finds herself to be pregnant. And she's betrothed, which is even more serious than engagement in our culture. She's betrothed to Joseph, and the two of them have not come together. They've not been intimate with one another, and she finds herself pregnant. So she knows that she herself and her family and her fiancé and his family, they're about to be scorned. They're about to be shamed. How in the world would Mary make people believe that the baby in her womb is God's son? Not even Joseph believed that when, when Mary shared it with him. He, he planned to quietly end the, the engagement, which would have been like a divorce in, in today's day and age. Mary knew her journey was not going to be an easy one. Maybe that's why Luke tells us in verse 39 of chapter 1, Mary hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. Mary must have heard about her relative Elizabeth's miraculous pregnancy. And if anyone was going to understand what Mary was going through, it would be her relative Elizabeth, who was very old and was with child based on the miraculous proclamation of Michael, the archangel. So off she went. And when she meets uh, Elizabeth, it's not joy like the burbling, gurgling, burping mud pots. It's joy like that geyser shooting 180 feet up into the air. It's uncontainable joy. And this is against the backdrop of discouragement from Elizabeth not being able to be pregnant all of those years. This joy is in the backdrop of disgrace, a virgin who's pregnant with child. This joy comes in light of grief and shame. Joy comes bursting through for both of these mothers to be. So Luke tells us in verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting meets my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Luke 1, 41 to 45. What a relief this must have been for Mary. She didn't have to explain herself. She didn't have to say, no, seriously, Joseph and I didn't get together. I'm telling you the truth. The angel said I was pregnant. It was him. It wasn't Joe. She didn't have to do any of that. Elizabeth knew. Even her developing baby leaped with joy. This was just the affirmation and the encouragement that both of these two women needed. Her, her joy came bursting through. Mary's joy came bursting through and she sang and praised and thanked God. In verses 46 to 55, you'll find this heading, Mary's song. And it says this, and, and Mary said, 
My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Luke 1, 46 to 45. This is a beautiful passage of scripture where two unlikely expecting mothers could share a deep understanding and affirmation for one another. Their meeting together fostered a spirit of joy. And it didn't matter what their lives were like in the past or what would happen in their future. Joy erupted for both Elizabeth and Mary. So this morning, I just want to briefly share three points that we can apply to our lives for our own intersection with God's joy. Point number one on your outline. It's okay to be joyful and happy. Now, for some of you, that's a no-brainer. That's like a no-duh kind of a statement. What do you mean? Of course it's okay to be joyful and happy. I love being joyful and happy. I want to be joyful and happy. Of course that's okay. (laughs) However, for others that are here this morning and watching and listening online. This statement makes you a little uncomfortable. Some people don't think they deserve to be happy or joyful. Some people carry around a heavy load of guilt and shame, and they can't forgive themselves for their past. And they think that because of what they've done, they can't be forgiven or they can't experience true joy because they're so weighted down by the burdens of their past. Some people are still grieving. Years after they've lost a a loved one, Christmas brings up memories, and they grieve all over again. But the first point is this. It's okay to be joyful and happy. Wherever you fall on the spectrum, if you're like, no doubt we can be happy, or you're weighted down by guilt and shame, or you're grieving, or you're struggling, No matter where you fall on that spectrum, regarding your personal experiences, because of what you've gone through, you're you're somewhere from the no doubt we can be happy to I don't want to be happy. You're, You're somewhere along that line. And it just depends on what you personally have gone through and experienced in your life. But I want to tell you, no matter where you fall on that spectrum, it's okay to be joyful and happy. The Bible doesn't really make a distinction between joyfulness and happiness. They're essentially different words, but they really do mean the same thing. And it's okay to be joyful and it's okay to be happy. It's okay to have those emotions. There is great joy in the Christmas season. So it's good to embrace and celebrate that joy. And those of you who find Christmas to be a painful, difficult season, even if you're hurting or grieving, 
If you're feeling discouraged because of this crazy COVID world that we live in, we've all been through a tough year. And and even so, it's okay to embrace joy. God sees you wherever you are. And God loves you wherever you are. I think it's God who's placed a natural joy, a natural desire for joy deep within us. And I I think that's because it's a reflection of his own joyful nature. God is our source of joy and happiness. That's why it's okay to be joyful and happy. It's okay to be joyful. It's okay to be happy because that's God's nature. And when we are born again, when we are indwelled by God, when he, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us, it changes us, it transforms us. We spend our lives becoming more like God. We strive to be more like Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And because a characteristic of his is joy, we too should realize it's okay to have joy. Here's point number two. Joy is our strength. Joy is our strength. There's a great example of this principle in the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was that Old Testament leader who got permission from his captors to return from exile in Babylon to rebuild the destroyed city of Jerusalem, starting with its walls. And this process was more than just a physical return to the city of Jerusalem. It was a spiritual returning to God. And it wasn't just for Nehemiah. It was for all of the people of Israel. It was. Nehemiah assembled all the people together. And he read out loud the law of Moses. And Nehemiah called the people and challenged the people to remember and return to their relationship with God. And as he does this, the the people of Israel are weeping. And I bet some of those there, as the, the, so to speak, the Bible was read, the, the law of Moses was read, some people were weeping because they were reconnecting with God and they remembered the stories of old even though they had spent years in captivity and their lives were so hard and difficult when they were reminded of their God they began to weep maybe tears of joy but I bet others in that crowd were weeping because they had fallen so far away from God and when they were brought back into God's presence they were reminded of how far they were away from him. And so some people wept with joy and other people wept with sadness and grief because of their own sorry state. But this is the beauty in the midst of this scene from Nehemiah. The the Bible tells us in this scene, people weeping, hearing the word of God. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says this, Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord. Enjoy it. Nehemiah says, this is a time for happiness because God has brought us back and he's restoring our city. And you know what? More importantly, he's restoring our hearts. He's rekindling our relationship and our love for him. It's okay to be happy. The joy of the Lord is our strength, our true source of happiness, of of joy and fulfillment. It comes from Christ. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. It was the ultimate fulfillment of of life. Peter describes it like this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, 
you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result, the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. It says an inexpressible. Our joy is inexpressible. It's glorious. Joy finds itself deeper than our grief, deeper than our guilt, deeper than our shame. Joy comes from a deep, deep well that we draw from. Now look, I'm not describing to you some kind of a don't worry, be happy, put on a plastic smile and fake it kind of joy. I'm not talking about that. How's it going? Oh, it's great, thanks. And your heart is breaking inside. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the joy that the Bible is describing. An inexpressible and glorious joy is deep down inside. In a rushing geyser, exploding and erupting. Other times it's a thick, slow gurgle. Let me encourage you that the joy of the Lord can be felt no matter what circumstances you're facing today. That leads me to our third point. Number three on your outline. We can choose joy. Joy is a choice. We can choose to be joyful. Many times in the Bible you find the word rejoice. 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 We don't use that word very often in today's culture, do we? But maybe we should. Maybe tomorrow afternoon you'll say, hey, it's five o'clock, work's over. Let's rejoice. Gone home. You know, the kids, the kids have this idea pretty good. It's snowing. Even on glasses. Let's go sledding. Rejoice. Woohoo! Rejoice. Can't we all say? Praise God, there's a vaccine. It's showing itself effective. We can rejoice someday the crazy COVID world of 20. That's normal again. Rejoice. Wish I could pause the recording. I can't. I just need to take a quick drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> I rejoice for this water. <laughs> Folks, rejoice is the verb. You know, a verb is an action word. Rejoice is the, the action of joy. Write down the word rejoice on your outline. I don't think I even did that. Just write it down. There's lots of margins. I want you to write down the word rejoice. Rejoice. Put an exclamation point. Underline it. Rejoice. Write that down on your outline. Because rejoicing is the action part of joy. It's feeling or expressing joy and delight. But I want you to notice this. The word rejoice starts with the pre Rejoice. That R-E prefix means once more. That R-E prefix Prefix means again. You watch a rerun on TV. You've already seen it. You see it again. Watch football this afternoon. You'll see an instant replay. The play already happened. It's going to be a replay where you see it. When I was a kid, we'd play football in the school playground. And sometimes when we'd kick off, we wouldn't throw it as far as we wanted to. So we'd yell out, re kick. Redo, I want to redo, I get a redo. Some of you watch TV and you, you stop paying attention and something happens and you go, wait, 
rewind. I can rewind and watch it again. The prefix RE means once more. It means again, or it means a return to. So let's rejoice and return to joy. It's a choice. It's an action. We can take action to return to joy. For Christians, it's a, it's a return to our source of joy. Our source of joy is Jesus. Amen. And you know what? Every day we make a, turn, a choice to return to him. Because every day, every day, we like sheep have gone astray. And we do our own things. We go down our own path. And we stray from the Lord. And we think we're happy. And we think we're having fun. And we think life is good. But eventually that shiny, happy thing that we entertain ourselves with gets old. And we realize we don't have joy in our lives. So we need to return. We need to repent and turn away from our sin and turn back to God and rekindle our love for Jesus Christ. And really, that's just what I want us to do as we conclude our service today. Give you an opportunity to return to Jesus, to return to God. And maybe like the people of Israel, when I, uh, Nehemiah was reading and proclaiming God's word, maybe some of us will weep because we remember how good God is. Maybe some of us will weep when we realize how far we've fallen away, that we've lost our first love. That we've been easily distracted and entangled with the entrapments of this world. We need to reconnect with God this morning. Jesus never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We, we go our own way and we do our own thing. But God is always there just waiting for us to turn around. At the very moment we decide to turn away from our sin and turn back to him. He runs to meet us, to hug us, to love us, to welcome us back in to his good graces, into a right relationship with him again. We have the opportunity to do that right now. We have screwed up this past week. Dude, ask my wife. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> don't talk to my parents. Don't talk to my wife. Don't talk to my kids. Sometimes don't you just have crappy weeks? <laughs> weeks where everything just goes off the rails. This is our choice to rejoice. It's our choice to go back to God, to find our true source of joy. It's in our relationship with Jesus. Knowing that he loves us. Knowing the extent that God loves us while we were still sinners. For our sins to show us the full extent of his love the full extent that he would sacrifice everything to make it possible for you and I to come back to him life is hard Look at, uh, look at James 1, 2 to 4. James says, consider it that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you're not lacking in anything. 
Some of you have been persevering this past week. Life has been hard for you. But when your faith is tested, your perseverance is developed. And that makes you a more mature believer in Christ. Makes you more complete, not lacking in anything. Now I admit, I'll be the first one to tell you when I'm hurting. I don't appreciate when people come and just blurt that verse out right in the middle of my face. When I want to feel sorry for myself, when I'm down, when I'm struggling, when I'm hurting. I'm not really encouraged by that during that time. Joy can feel so far away when we're grieving, when we're depressed, when we're afraid, when we're faced with unthinkable decisions that have to be made. James isn't saying to be happy about all of those circumstances in your life. He's saying even in the midst of them, you can find joy when you find God who's bigger circumstances, who's bigger than your problems, who's bigger than your fears. The bigger picture is that God is working all things together for our good. Yeah. And that bigger picture starts at the source. And that source is Jesus. So I want us to just quiet our hearts and our minds. And I want us to take a few moments to spiritually prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. We, we all have communion? Did we, did we all get those this morning? Yeah? Shake? Let me know, please. Yes. Yeah. You know what? I, I don't have one, and I'd really like one. Um, Ralph, Ralph who, if you don't have one and you'd like to take communion, would you please put your hands up? We've got several here that would like to take communion this morning. Right behind you, too, Scott. Thank you. One more spot. So listen, this morning as we spiritually prepare, this is what I want us to do. This is what I want us to focus on. I want us to focus on reconnecting with God. And so the quietness of this moment, I, I want us to reconnect. I want us to repent of our sin. The Holy Spirit to reveal to you moments where you went off the rails. Maybe your sin is less conspicuous than mine. But make no mistake about it. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And, and sometimes we don't know it. Maybe that's the most uh, scary kind of sin there is because we separate ourselves from God and we don't even know it. So we need to pray and ask the Spirit of God to reveal to us where we're missing the mark. And then let's recommit our lives to him. Let's just quietly pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for hearing our confessions. Thank you that you are faithful and just, that when we confess our sins, you are, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that brings us joy. That lifts a weight of guilt and a load of shame off of our shoulders. 
God, thank you for joy that comes through Jesus. Father, we repent of our sins and we recommit our lives to you. We thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you for your universal acceptance of us to meet us where we are, to clothe us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we could never have on our own. Thank you, Jesus, for your precious blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. Your blood that washes our sin white as snow. that was pierced for our transgressions, the suffering that you endured on our behalf, the blood that you shed, so you could utter these final words on the cross, it is finished. All of the sins for all of the people throughout all time, all of the sin has been paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus died for our sins. Thank you, God, for the significance of communion that we hold in our hands, the, the symbolic bread in the symbolic cup, which represents the body and the blood of Jesus, which was broken and shed for us so that we may be forgiven, that we may be restored, that we may have everlasting life and abundant life here on earth. God, in just a moment, we will eat and we will drink in remembrance of Jesus and what he did. And we are all in the same boat. None of us are perfect. We need salvation that comes through faith in Christ. Believing that he died for our sins. That he shed his blood. To cover us of all of our iniquity. Jesus, thank you for instituting this practice. This communion of the saints. where we can come together of one heart, one mind, unified in knowing that we are not perfect and never will be, but that we are forgiven because we are believers in Jesus Christ and we memorialize his death and the shedding of his blood because we know that that brings forgiveness of and is the start of a joyful life. Let us eat and drink together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your love. Thank you for showing us the full extent of your love by allowing your son Jesus to come to this earth. To be the way, the truth, and the life. To pay the price, the penalty for all mankind. That we may have forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. Jesus, thank you.
Father God, help us to rediscover Christmas this year by embracing joy, no matter what our circumstances are. Help us to remember each day that the source of our joy is Jesus. That we seek our happiness in him. Christmas is a time when we focus on Jesus at his birth. It brings us hope and peace and joy. Help us to continue the process of rejoicing despite the pain and challenges that we're facing. Help us to heed the good news of the angels that will bring great joy to all of us that a Savior has been born. To us, a child is given. Father, we pray that this week, this day, you would fill us with hope and peace and joy. And that you would allow us to take your light that is within us and let it shine in a dark world. To share this message of hope and peace and joy with a world that so desperately needs to hear it. God, we go forth now in your name to do your work. To spread the joy that only you can give. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let me just share this with you as a benediction. <laughs> Nehemiah 8, 10, the second part says, This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go forth with strength and the joy of the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed.